By the powers of truth and light. By the recording light shining bright. For nightmare they ardor, Odoni and harder. As temporal discussion once more stands aright. Welcome, listeners of Illusion, to Temporal Discussion, the episode-by-episode episode nightmare retrospective podcast. I'm Martin Harder, and at this point, I've as good a chance as any. And I'm Martin O'Doney, and my mites are down and my tights are up. We're back with a brand new series, but before we get into the episode, I'd like to introduce our very special guest, listeners of Illusion. It gives us great pleasure to welcome Treyguard himself, the legendary star of stage and screen, Hugo Myatt. Hello, everyone. It's an honour and a privilege to have you on board, Hugo. We've been looking forward to this for weeks and weeks. Very nice to be here, or there. Or oh, wherever we are. Is it an illusion? Cyberspace is an illusion, yes. This is the point where we usually ask our guests what their link to Nightmare is. But I think it's probably quite obvious in this case. I suspect so. I, I sort mm. of did it all from beginning to end. <laughs> <laughs> so I was there quite a lot. How did you actually get the part? Oh, that was a very long, complicated story. But um, basically, I, I knew Tim Child sort of socially. I'd done a few bits at Anglia Television. Uh, and um, in the very early days, it was going to make a, a pilot. And I was actually working in a boatyard at the time. I had a boat on the broad. And um, he said to me, he said, uh, Hugo, um, you're an actor, aren't you? I said, yes. He said, uh, look, I'm, I'm doing this pilot. Um, it, it won't be shown or anything, but we're just doing it to work out whether it'll actually actually happen, you know, whether it can work. I'll meet you and we'll, I'll talk to you about it. So we met up and he talked to me and explained it all to me. Mm. And I said, yes, yes, fine, fine. I didn't understand a word he was talking about. I have no <laughs> idea what he was about, the concept or anything. But anyway, we uh, we eventually did a 15-minute or whatever it was pilot. And I sort of got the gist of it. And I thought that was it. And I had a few bob in my hand. Uh, and so uh, I more or less forgot about it. Then about, I don't know how many months later, he phoned me again and said, Hugo, we're, we're, we're making another pilot, a full-length one this time. Um, it won't be shown, but uh, <laughs> that was very, very emphasize what you said and um, so I did that and it worked a lot better than I thought and that was great but in the way of these things uh, from my experience people who make the pilot very rarely get the job you know because yeah. they yeah. then look for a name a star or whatever uh, and I more or less wrote it off then and about uh, I don't know how many months later he phoned me up to Hugo he said um, we've got a series and I said oh Fantastic. Well, I hope it goes really well. He said, no, 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 no. We've got a series. You and me. So that's sort of how it happened in short. And he didn't say, this won't be shown, I take it. <laughs> that time he did. <laughs> Thank you. No, it actually got shown rather a lot in the end, didn't it? Yeah. It was always you who was going to be Trey Guard. It was never, ever any question of anybody else, as far as you know. Um, I can't guarantee that. I suspect, I don't know. I don't want in any way to uh, put it down on Tim, but I suspect they probably did look for a name. But I think the commissioning editors, which at that time was uh, ITV, they said, as long as you use that guy. Brilliant. So, uh, they <laughs> what, are. More, what more could you possibly want? Yeah, well, that's it. <laughs> so, you know. Well, make magnificent. So, um, obviously, we've never seen any of the pilots. Is there a huge difference between the pilots and what actually became Nightmare? I don't think so. I mean, they were just trying out the scenario. Of course, what they were really trying out was, was the technicalities, um, how to do it. I mean, I don't know whether you understand it all. And the, and the, the, the whole thing is uh, designed by David Brown, at least the uh, first couple of series were. Mm. And all those scenarios you see. They're not easy to do because you have to have a fixed camera and everything has to be drawn or created to a perspective. And so it's a very complicated situation to set up. And also you'll notice everybody's got shadows, which in previous things of uh, chroma key or whether it was um, what we then, we were blue screen. Now it's green screen, isn't it? Um, but it, it, it's quite difficult to achieve shadows. <laughs> I, but in the earlier ones you see everybody sort of slightly floating off the ground yes. Yes. yeah so it was, it was a lot of innovation went on it was really very clever some of it i still don't know how they did i was thinking it was really video and not computers to that extent yeah well obviously computers around but i mean 
a lot of it was pure video stuff. It was originally called Dungeon Doom, wasn't it? Um, I think they did call it various things, yes. Yeah, it was... Um, I'd like to shake the hand of the person who decided to change it <laughs> because of the, yeah. sure that, that did sound <laughs> awfully corny. I thought, yes, I, I, and also um, people kept saying it's Dungeons and Dragons, which it wasn't really. But it, yeah. one of the most difficult things for me was when I was interviewed, particularly on radio, and, and they'd say, um, "Well, tell us what this show's about." How do you to somebody who's never seen? It? I mean, <laughs> no, it's exactly. absolutely impossible. You could say, "Well, we've got three people." And a fourth one in a bucket, walking around, and the other three are shouting at you. <laughs> yes. yeah. That is accurate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, it's a game. It start by saying it's a game show. I think is, is where you'd have to start there. But you're quite yeah. right. You, you can't sum it up that quickly, can you? It, it would take minutes on ends <laughs> to, to get the proper gist <laughs> across. If you say, um, "Well, the, the child is blindfolded. You blinded a child." You know, they go like that. <laughs> Or we get people say, and then what do you do? We kill them. You kill children. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was the uh, the famous Mary Whitehouse incident. Yes, yes that was extraordinary. Yeah. Um, but that was even mm. before it was shown. We said something yes. about something like um, this ghastly middle-aged man going around um, killing children or something like that. <laughs> She did eventually apologise, I gather. Never been terribly fond of Mary Whitehouse myself. No, but, um, no. When she was wrong, she could at least <laughs> hold her hand up and say, I was wrong. So you've got mm. to give her that. Publicity, so I suppose everybody wanted to watch it and see if we really did kill children. Absolutely. She did, she ended up doing the show a favour, <laughs> I think. I suppose you could have called it snuff, but I suppose that would be a bad idea. Well, it hasn't been tried yet. But that's what we can rename the podcast, Mr. H. Yeah, I'd rather you didn't. <laughs> no, I, right, I, did, okay. I did a movie which eventually got called Snuff. Or snuff. Yes, I've seen it. And, um, <laughs> that started off being called uh, Man with a Movie Camera. And it continued being called that until uh, finally they had released it. And suddenly I found I was in a film called a snuff movie. You know. So what's the film about? It's confidential. <laughs> not a great idea. It wasn't a great film either. Oh, no. You were definitely the best thing in it. I have to say. And I'm not just saying that. It was very strange. Um, it was weird, wasn't I it? I had not any idea what I'd let myself in for, as you can imagine. <laughs> That's what you did with Nightmare, really. Wasn't well, it? yes, true. But, um, <laughs> at least Nightmare, I could have run away. But I was in um, in Romania where it was filmed, so there was no running mm. away at all. There we go. We did these things. Yeah. And actors like me, ho! Oh. You make it sound rather dangerous, actually. <laughs> so. Oh, it is. <laughs> Mr. H is an actor as well, of course. Formerly. Star of stage, screen and Coca-Cola commercials. I never did Coca-Cola. I, I did uh, Aero. I had a face that people didn't think would sell a car, you know. So I didn't get to do commercials. I did voiceovers commercials, but not, nothing else. Which voiceovers did you do? I mean, I did Double Diamond and all sorts of dreadful things. Oh, well, that is going back a bit, yeah. I remember playing black and white for the first time and getting very excited when I recognised your voice. Oh, yes, and then I did, what was the other one? Fable. Then they got all snotty and wanted lots of posh names, didn't they? And yes. it, it failed then. <laughs> so that gives you that <laughs> doubly satisfying. Well, it was a bit because they were so keen to have me the first two times. And then suddenly they had this idea, we've got all these wonderful names to do things. And it didn't seem, mm. I don't know anything about computer games, really. Mm. I mean, I've done a great many, but only putting voices to them, you know. As soon as you've got an established cast for anything, um, the worst thing you can do is just change it for the sake of it, I think. It yeah. doesn't matter if, you, if you're able to replace them with somebody famous um, because you change the character of the programme. And so every, the loyal audience you've got is immediately going to be less interested in watching it. So let's set the scene for the episode. Season three began in its new Friday time slot on the 8th of September 1989. Ride on Time by Black Box was the number one single, and the number one film in the UK was Lethal Weapon 2. Yes, now, um, as I said in episode zero, I like Ride on Time, so just drop it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> just drop it. It was weird, but it was a good song. I've never said it was a bad song, the, the, pol the politics behind it. The actual single was obviously immoral, but the, um, the actual yes. song itself behind all that controversy was actually a pretty good song. Did the singer actually get paid? I think it? after a court case, I think she did, yeah. It doesn't really redeem Black Box, but uh, at least she did get paid. And Lethal Weapon 2? It's, it's Lethal Weapon 1 all over again. Did you see the Lethal Weapons films, uh, Hugo? 
I think I saw the first one, and probably you've seen them on television when I'm slightly asleep. You've seen the first one. You've um, you've seen all of them. <laughs> you really, you really have. It's a bit like the Bourne conspiracy, isn't yeah. it? You sort of think, oh, we've been here, done that, and now time turns. The recording light burns. Time out is gone. The podcast is on. Oh, yes. This is fantastic. (laughs) I've been dreaming of this day since September 1987. I swear I have. Literally, I was watching right from the very first broadcast to the very first episode, and I I don't think I ever missed one, except one episode when I was in hospital with a broken leg. (laughs) Apart from that, I was completely hooked, and Trey God was the main reason. I've had my fangirl moment. We can do the podcast now. By the powers of truth and light, by the sword of justice bright, Make and mend, shift and blend, till nightmare once more stands aright. The episode begins with a pre-title sequence featuring Traegard's head superimposed over some fire. A sword is also amongst the flames as Traegard speaks. The whole thing makes a rather atmospheric introduction, which then leads into the familiar title sequence. Season three um, is considered by many to be the best, and it's already a little bit different <laughs> from the first two, um, because this is this opening episode is the first ever to include a pre-title sequence. Um, it would happen at the opening of every season after this, getting a bit longer and a bit more elaborate as the years pass. I have to remember it. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I do like the idea. I, th- I do think the start of this new season should be marked in this way, but I think I preferred it in its earlier forms here, when it didn't carry on for more than about fifteen seconds. I don't know. I quite like the fact that it it hit the screen like that bang, whereas with the opening uh, title, you know, the, the, the 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 music and the uh, opening title thing, what do you call it? Um, it was nice, but it seemed a bit um, tame. It was the same as every other episode, whereas this is the start of a new season, so it could do with something else just to bring you in to mark the moment. I, I don't know. I think they thought I was quite frightening, so they like to frighten people a bit, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of kids tell me, that, or people who have grown up from having watched it, but they said they used to watch it from behind the sofa and things, you know, so that so they could duck down if it got too frightening. It never did get very frightening. But... Mm. Oh, it did It did to us when we were 13. Yes, yeah, <laughs> I promise you, I promise you. I have a friend who actually has an actual phobia of, of Traegard, and um, she was at Play Expo a few years ago, and you were there, and um, you said to her... Did I frighten you in childhood or something? And she's like, <laughs> you still do. <laughs> there was one lovely young lady who came up to me at one of the conventions and stood there and just went, and not a word came out. She uh, was there for about a minute and just, and then ran away. Kept well, saying, well, that, me- that may be shyness rather than fear. but uh... yeah, I don't know what it was, but I kept <laughs> thinking, well, my mum loved me. You know. <laughs> I'm really quite lovable. <laughs> Mostly. So the interesting thing is, what I always found lovable about you was how scary you were. <laughs> so, <laughs> I felt bad about this even now, but sometimes, how can I put this? The fact of the matter is, the way we did this is that the children never saw us off set. So you were always in character, so to speak. No, well, they never saw us. And we were yeah. just there when the action was going to take place. And I remember on several occasions when I said, Enter, stranger. You'd be shaking like that, you know. And I thought, oh God, what am I doing to these poor kids? You know, am I traumatizing them for life? Um, but they quickly forgot it, you know. And they, once they're off, they're off. You do feel a bit guilty standing there as a middle aged man, frightening some poor child to death, you know. Um, but they wanted to do it. The reality is, a lot of kids watch these things because they like to be scared. Mm. <laughs> so that's the thing. They love being scared. It's it's exciting. It's only when we get when we're grown up that we start hating being scared. I always thought it was the only show that's ever had audience participation, by which I mean, you've got the three advisors shouting at the Dungeoneers and everybody at home shouting at the three advisors. So you've actually got two layers of drama. Yes, it's magnificent interactive fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome once again to the Dungeon of Deceit. A Traegard, Dungeon Master at your service. Do you passive ones dare my catacombs? No, I thought not. Still no matter, for many from your world have accepted my challenge. And even now, the dungeon eagerly awaits them. The first of many changes this series is Traegard's costume. Gone is Ooh, the old... Yes. 
the old brown number with the shiny gold buttons. And in its place is a much more imposing studied black leather tunic. A grey large collared shirt resides underneath and the look is completed with a brown leather cloak complete with shoulder pads. So my wife actually had a theory about your changing costumes over the Mm. years. Obviously, as the budgets improved, the costumes improved. And you looked better and more regal as each series went by. Her theory is that Treyguard is actually the human embodiment of the dungeon. And as it feeds on children, you become more... Uh, Mellower. <laughs> Two things here. Well, when they started, they wanted to make it look very medieval. They actually put uh, Fuller's Earth in my hair. God knows why. They did. I, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. I was, I was going to and, and I, you know, I came out there like I'd been in a mud pack or something. And um, funny enough, they never actually talked to me about these changes. The first costume actually was changed several times. So I, you know, I went into makeup costume, put it on. I didn't even notice for the first couple of times they actually changed the costume. And then it went to this this studied one, which I always tell people had Harley Davidson studs across the back, but nobody believes me. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think they wanted to move it on. The whole thing move on to. Uh, um, to be honest, the first two series were a little bit samey, weren't they? A little bit repetitive. Yeah. yeah. So they wanted to change it and make it a bit more authoritative somehow. It's quite difficult because if you, if this is a particular example, this particular episode, when you have very young children, like the, the first team, the little Scots lads, they were quite young. And you've got to be a lot uh, pleasanter, a lot less frightening. Otherwise, nothing happens. So you've got to help them a bit more without cheating the game. And then you've got the next lot, who are actually quite sort of sassy. You know, they, they knew what they were doing. And um, so I could be a bit harder with them, a bit sort of more frightening. You have to understand that in the first two series, before we got to Lord Fear, I had to provide the menace as well as mm. the help, which is quite a difficult trick to play. You know, I always felt that once we got this arch villain, the Treyguard role was rather diminished. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Trey Guard in this season um, starts to become less sinister than he was in the first two. Was, um, in the first two, he was he was um, he, he was almost evil a lot of the time, and he really seemed to enjoy um, seeing Dungeoneers getting into trouble, <laughs> which is one of the things I always loved about him. I want to see you go through the dungeon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was, that, that was one of the great things about him. Here he, he, he starts to, he sort of evolves into something a bit like Ben Kenobi um, <laughs> over, the, over the course of about three seasons. Che Gard, he looks a lot grander and more aristocratic now. The, the slightly brushed back um, hair from the temples is a bit 1940s for a medieval <laughs> dungeon master, but we'll let that slide. Um, I also had an orange period. I don't know what happened. Because if you're being made up you don't think about it you just sit there in the chair thinking about what you've got to say and what you've got to do and they think but one season i was totally orange it was extraordinary i still didn't know it until the building thing was shown i think the announcers on challenge tv have commented on that um when nightmare was being shown um in the in the mm. mid-2000s it was um the thing doesn't he doesn't he look orange in some of these <laughs> some of these episodes at the moment? i've really <laughs> been drinking something very strange or else the uh, makeup lady was colorblind. I don't know which, which it was. But anyway. No, in that season, what it was was the fire was was bigger than it was in the other season. So the orange glow from it was was was, was connected <laughs> with your face more. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it's, it's the fire. Yeah. So why indeed should we keep him waiting? Enter, stranger. Tregar wastes absolutely no time bringing in our first engineer of the series, Gavin Gillespie. He is joined by advisors Tom, Brian and Craig, and they all hail from Uddingston, South Lanarkshire. Tregar greets the team and explains to them the rules appertaining to the knapsack, life force and helmet. With that out of the way, Tregar guides Gavin to the dungeon door and the quest begins. That's definitely one of the stronger points already in the third season is they're trying to get the rules run down, sped up and less, less repetitive because... I think every single uh, quest in season two, you did the same rules rundown verbatim every single time. I did actually mention it, uh, but at the time they didn't think, they thought they had to do it. I suppose they were building an audience. Yeah. Thankfully, I thought by season two they didn't need to, but, you know, 
Uh, yes. The audience knew it's a bit like Jeremy Paxman. You know, well, you all know the rules, so let's get going, or whatever he says when he gets niggled yes. at the university <laughs> challenge. Yeah. There was a similar thing in season one with the wall monsters and the riddles as well, where the wall monster would explain the riddle contest and then you would explain That's the right riddle know, contest yeah. immediately after. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was painful. It's painful to rewatch that those moments nowadays. <laughs> Funny so. enough, a lot of children were actually scared to death of the wall monster, which surprised me. I can see that. That, having been scared to death for the wall monster myself at the time. Well, the first one, a guy called <laughs> a guy called his name was Guy Standee. He was absolutely charming gentleman. I suppose the trouble was I was influenced by that. I mean, he was such a nice man. <laughs> you couldn't imagine him frightening anybody. You know? <laughs> I can't remember actually being scared of the wall monsters um, when I was a kid. I, I did find them a bit unpleasant. The riddles were quite tricky. I mean, some some were obvious. But others weren't particularly. Nobody told me the answers oh, right. to these things. So I was sitting there and someone was thinking, you know, I'm thinking, mm. okay, right, yes, well, that's obvious. What but, I... So when you gave the the, the, um, the teams a clue, yeah. you actually... I had no idea what the answer was. So... Oh, it's okay. So that now, might have been some, Sometimes I didn't actually work it out and I'm thinking, oh, God, they're going to ask me. And unfortunately, they didn't. That's interesting, though. Well, I'd always thought that you you knew the, that you knew the answers and so you, you had clues re- at the ready. I didn't, I didn't realise that you were... You were actually playing. Didn't bother to so. tell me. I, <laughs> no. I could have been as well. Perhaps I am as thick as two short planks. But um, certainly later on, there was some that really fucks me. And I think, you know, God, don't let them ask me. Don't let them ask me. The one that always sticks in my mind is um, where falls the blow that harms you not yet ends the state of common man. I had no idea as a kid, and I had no idea when I rewatched it. I have no idea now what the answer to that is. I probably should, but. It was one of Cedric's riddles in season one. And the answer is the shoulder, because you're getting the the sword is making contact with your shoulder when it, when you're being knighted. It was a bit of a word salad. <laughs> That's Tim, you see. Uh, Tim wrote practically all of it, I think. Tim Child. Yes, he could be very, very uh, devious, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> We love you really, Tim, if you're listening. Yeah, well, he's, he's a brilliant bloke, but yeah. uh, there you go. He was learning on the job as much as anybody. I did check something before we started recording. Gavin's team only entered the quest after uh, three minutes and 19 seconds of the episode. <laughs> Anorak City. I know! That is actually 38 seconds longer than it took Martin's team to enter the quest at the start of season two. Uh, so maybe the feeling of be- things being speeded up is uh, all an illusion. Yes, well, obviously it was. I suppose, again, I was trying to be a bit kinder at the beginning. So probably I wasn't quite so um, sharp. You know. Get the helmet on. Out you go. I think a lot of us <laughs> by this point would have paid you to do that. Though. Yes, but, it, you know, it, it is television. We are actually dealing with human beings, these poor little things. For me, um, this, the interesting thing was I'd moved from Devon to Glasgow um, in the summer of 1989, and they're about as different as two places can be without moving overseas. Um, and I was offering, suffering from this incredible culture shock in the autumn of 89. So when the third season of Nightmare starts up, I'm thinking to myself, ah, oh, thank goodness, something familiar is back in my life. And the first team of the season turns out to be from just down the road from flipping Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't get away from it. I mean, they advertised locally on radio and in the papers and all sorts of things. And then they auditioned. Yeah, they did a mock game. The difficulty is always is getting a team of four because everybody's got a couple of friends and so they they pick their chums and then they have to cast around for one more and sometimes they picked a dodo there's no doubt about it you know and the other thing the problem was all of them without exception all of them wanted to go under the helmet now actually that's the worst job in the whole thing because all you do is get shouted at and if you step off the cliff or whatever you do and you kill the team they ain't going to be happy with you so it's actually the worst job but we couldn't stop the brightest one always wanted to go under the helmet and that's a shame isn't it because they're the ones who are going to give all the color and all the life yeah, to the advisors right. yeah. yeah i'm not knocking them uh, some du- some dungeoneers were very good even though they you know the moment you stop somebody seeing something they tend to stop talking you know what i mean so I guess silent, which was a bit of a shame. You really wanted them to join in as well, but they never really did. Or well, few did, but not many. I think Jason did well under the helmet, um, being yeah. involved yes. in, in the team decisions. Um, and I mean, the, you know, you're doing television, there's sort of production values. Some teams are very good. I mean, total anorak are dead boring because they come in and they yes. say, dah, 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 turn left, uh, sidestep, out to the north. That's it. Which is, for television, unfortunately, not much good. Your life force is green, and at this point, you've as good a chance as any. Turn now, face the dungeon door, and step boldly forward. (laughs) 
New to the series are the dwarf tunnels between rooms. These were designed to make the dungeon feel bigger and showcase the early CGI effects of the time. As the production only had access to static cameras, the dungeoneers were filmed from behind, walking on the spot to give the illusion of venturing down the tunnels. This version of the tunnels was exclusive to series 3 and they appeared on all three levels and had different distinct colours for each level. Level 1 tunnels were blue, level 2 tunnels were red, and the one time a tunnel appeared in level 3, it was ivory. That's Anorak <laughs> for you. <laughs> I suppose they just, as they say, wanted to um, give a, a suggestion of depth. I think there was also one of the slight nagging irritations in the first two seasons was there was always a discontinuity between rooms mm. where the dungeoner would leave a chamber for a doorway that was a sort of arch shaped and he'd come through outside <laughs> for a door that was square shaped. Yeah. So, so they, sort of, they wanted to find a way of covering the gap between that. You, you think of um, Ariadne's lair in the first, in the second season, which was a core yard with walls that didn't even go to the ceiling uh you walk through the door and suddenly you wind up in the hall of folly which is a study with this magnificent norman style archway entering into it there's no connection at all and i think i think that's why the tunnels were introduced all in theater architectural integrity you know when you walk out of a door you don't fall down the cliff which apparently, if, if your architecture is wrong, you can. <laughs> <laughs> or if your architecture is a nightmare, you certainly can. I preferred the actual live corridors in the later seasons. I didn't. I thought they destroyed any immersion than was what was happening, because you could see the walls and all their perspex glory with the light shining behind them. But whatever you think of any of the dwarf tunnels, they are better than the eye shield. Yes. Hugo, do you have an opinion on the eye shield? Yes, I do. Fundamentally, I think Tim wanted to get rid of the blindfold aspect. And the trouble is, for me, I thought that is actually what made the program. It was a virtue of necessity. And so that is, in fact, what made it work. I mean, it's blind man's buck. The relationship between the dungeon and the advisors is king. If, if you don't have that, you don't have the same gameplay at well, all. There, there's nothing there. I mean, and, and virtual reality is what the aim was eventually, I think. The but the truth is, for, for a long time, virtual reality was great for the person in the thing. Not much good for three people sitting on the sofa next to him, is it? And I couldn't understand why he was always trying to produce what was in effect virtual reality for, for one person i didn't think that would make television but that was me you know, I'm, it's, I'm it's a, a fu- it's it's a funny pattern throughout tv history that often the creator of the program doesn't understand it anywhere near as much as some of the other people working on it i must be fair to tim i think he was brilliant and what he did he created was a brilliant a brilliant show but i personally wasn't mad on the eye shield and all that stuff for that reason because i think we were losing the two interactive things which is the advisors and dungeoneer and the people at home screaming at the advisors and i think tim has gone on to retroactively say that he thinks the eye shield was a bad idea he did admit a number of years ago he hated the eye shield Mm. but he was under pressure um from citv to speed the game up He, he obviously felt if he put in something that made the decisions for you it would hurry the teams up a bit there are all sorts of aspects uh, particularly as you say the politics behind it all of which i have absolutely no knowledge whatsoever you know i was too busy doing what i was doing to actually know what the hell was going on behind the screens mm. as being where am i oh well, you're in a room there looks to be in the middle of kind of box thing and there's a dice in it mm. all life's a game of chance gavin so roll the bones and learn your fate if you can face the greater challenge to come you can surely face this one We have uh, discussed the Dice Room in the past, even though it hasn't actually appeared until now. As far as we're concerned, it pales in comparison to the Wheel of Fate, um, which started quests in Season 2. What we've got here is basically just a large green room that uh, feels a bit like a giant Yahtzee board. In front of Gavin, we've got this similarly green box housing a large die. The die is the only thing in the chamber that isn't green. The team instructs him to roll the die, and doing so causes a much larger CGI die to roll into view from somewhere behind the camera. It bounces off the walls of the chamber and comes to rest in front of the plucky young dungeoneer with the number one dot facing him. The die opens up to reveal three doors, one on the left, one on the right, and one in the centre. No further clues, the team follow the adventurer's code and guide Gavin through the door on the right. As we say, Mr H, we think this is a step backwards from what was in season two. Yeah, I like it more than you do, don't I? I think so, yeah. Uh, The way the animated die always opened up on side one was a real fourth wall breaker. Yeah, that's that's kind of a shame. I suppose that, again, had to do something variety-wise. What was your favourite sort of 
place of choice. Yeah, there's so many uh, people, somebody says, I mean, you know, there must have been some funny things happened. Well, I'm sure they were, but, you know, it was quite a, an intense thing to do. When you did what I think the most serious we did, was it 16 once or something like that? And the original ones started, we did six weeks, but then it got shorter and shorter. So we did the whole series in that time. I mean, that's a lot for me to get in my head. I mean, uh, I didn't get to mix much with the rest of the company because... I was too busy learning what blooming scenarios were coming up all the time. Uh, whereas they often, you know, the other uh, players often had only one scenario in, in that game. So they only had that bit and they could spend the time not down the pub, whatever they went to do. <laughs> but I was at it the whole time. So it was quite intense for me. So I, I can't, you know, I don't really have favourites about anything. I think this one was a bit of a step backwards. If nothing else, they could have got different animations for the die when it rolled into view so they could open on different sides each time. I, mean, I think they could have done that particular one better. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, the whole idea of chance is what the die is about, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But maybe maybe uh, one or two occasions they could have got rid of the dice and instead had cards on the table um, and you deal a card... Um, and that card then appears in giant form in front of you, and that opens up to reveal a door or something. Just, just, just something to vary it up a bit because it is a bit boring uh, as, mm. as it stands. I always thought the dice was a, another reference to uh, Dungeons and Dragons, which uses dice quite a lot. But then again, that would be a completely different type of dice. It's just a way of doing another random thing. You know, you you take your chances, you you toss the die, and uh, whatever comes up is what you then have to follow. But I, there are rules always room that really don't do much. I mean, one of my biggest regrets is we never actually managed to blow anybody up in the bomb room. You did? We managed to blow someone up. Team 4. Did we? It's when you first said, ooh, nasty. It was Team 4 Season 1. It was your very first, ooh, nasty. Sometimes they had to slow the fuse down so much because they come and say, you're in a room. Yes. We've done that issue to death. We really have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it just... It just um, it keeps growing back. Yeah. They think, slow the fuse, slow the fuse. They're still discussing it. <laughs> 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 you never blew anyone up for taking too long, but no. I I think it was um Yeah, it was when they were uh, already in losing already status. In losing yeah. It, yeah. It was the ones that were in losing status you blew up, but yeah, it was, it was there was so, uh, I think there was two in season two as well that you blew up. Oh gosh, yeah. oh good. Well that makes me think I could now. Yeah, I'm glad you were. <laughs> you really are Trey Gard, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, team one in season two, um, called Martin. Funnily enough, um, he was he was blown up um, because he didn't uh, get the secret of the gauntlet from the clue room. You're going to go rewatch a lots of early nightmare now, you? <laughs> I have to watch just those, to yeah. see just to see them getting blown up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely! <laughs> yeah, made your day, haven't we? Where am I? Right, Gav, there's a there's a bit of room. And there's four doors, two in the back wall and one on each side. In the middle, there's a massive big hole, okay? So just stay where you are. Okay, Gavin, take two steps forward. Watch or something, there's a snake coming out. Take Take two. One more, one more forward, Gavin. Danger team, this is the lair of the dreaded car. Much depends here on whether it's fed recently or not. Escape as you can. Gavin has emerged in a sand-coloured chamber with four doors. One to either side and two in the front. In the middle of the chamber is a large square pit from which a gigantic cobra emerges. This is the dreaded car which menaces our dungeoneer by moving slowly from side to side in an area we can't possibly come into contact with him. Despite this, the team have a little bit of a panic and have to be reminded by Traegard to guide Craig through the door. I like the dreaded car because it is an imposing figure but it's only re-watching it I actually worked out it's not a real snake. Or at least it's not a live snake. We've basically got another snake chamber. Mm. It's the same problem. All they're, all they're actually running away from is a video recording, so we can't actually chase them. No, of course. Um, I mean, uh, that's absolutely true in a lot of ways. <laughs> but um, they don't know that. No, they don't. No, no. So, well, we didn't know that when we were watching at the time. I think it was a live snake uh, when they did it. Um, I don't think it was a... I can't remember now, but there were various animals. There was a great stallion at one time, which uh, mm. they recorded. But I think uh, we had a separate, I can't remember which seasons, we had two actual um, voids, as we called them. A smaller one, which the kids never went into, which we could actually have something going on and superimpose onto the other one. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, series uh, two, I think. The chamber itself is actually just the alternative four-door chamber from the first two seasons. 
but with a pit in the middle of it now. So um, uh, I, I do rather like at the beginning of the scene, the continuity of having Gavin enter the room side on. <laughs> I like that how, he, too. how he sidestepped through out of the dice chamber. I like that. Uh, <laughs> this is just, it's, it's just a basic get out of here fast um, first danger room. Um, the dramatic yeah. throb of music and, and Hugo's impressive conviction as he, as he describes the dreaded car. <laughs> um, it's, it, it makes it just, just scary enough to, to give a sense of urgency. Um, and to distract from the fact that the, the way the car is clearly not paying the slightest bit of attention to Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> it's also the first Egyptian-influenced chamber mm. that we've had, which does become a running theme throughout Series 3. It does, to an extent, yeah. But David Rowe is, as you know, the designer of yeah. all these um, early rooms. And he, you know, he's a very clever chap and uh, very talented. So probably, thinking of snakes, he did actually decide to go east and, and put a bit of, um, as you were saying, a bit of Pharaohese in it. So you notice that Gavin actually leaves by one of the left doors, Naughty. I also mm. list out for a blooper very carefully um, as he's about to leave. He turns left to face the fl- face the door and you can hear his trainers squeaking really loudly in the background, yes. which really breaks <laughs> the fourth wall. Um, something which does need commenting on here, even though it is um, a, a very much another geek's detail. The animation when walking through the doors has changed completely from seasons one and two. Back mm. then, the image of the chamber would sort of retreat from the screen into a red void which was taken from the life force clock but now we zoom in very rapidly towards the door the dungeoneer is entering i don't think that's a great idea because the pixelation of the dungeon art really starts to become very obvious as you get closer to it I think the reason is that um, a lot of them were walked into war ah, right okay <laughs> so um you, you know we had to we had to abort before they actually uh walk smack into well no wall actually but you know what i mean um appeared to walk straight into a wall so or, or through right it. that makes sense because so, uh, they didn't quite get the accuracy right so when you zoom in the dungeoneer is suddenly below the image and therefore we can't <laughs> see the collision that's actually quite clever oh i'll, 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 I'll I think that's worth mentioning on the forums. Though. I think a lot of people will be interested. That's that's quite clever. So. It's quite difficult to actually line them up against the door because it, it's so distorted by the perspective used that it's not quite where you think it is from outside on the monitor. I do sometimes think, do we really need to quibble over whether they're walking exactly towards the door? They're going to get there eventually. Let's just move on to the next chamber anyway. Oh, another change um, when moving between rooms now. First season, you heard a sort of dull roar like you're plunging into deep water. Now it's a loud whistling noise. You see how much of a geek I am? Yes, I do. I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated. <laughs> oh, it's that bad, is it? Okay, we'll move on. <laughs> We're into another dwarf tunnel. You're in a long tunnel room. Just walk forward and there's bats coming down from the ceiling. There's loads of doors, loads of doors, and doors on every side. Every Caution, side. team. The dungeon has taken a weird shift in its latest phase, and the path that Gavin is on is unfamiliar to me. Make haste, Gavin, but keep alert the rest of you, or you'll lose your friend before you've hardly started. Gavin, keep going, Gavin, faster. So the dwarf tunnels do happen quite regularly, so we won't talk about them too much unless something particularly noteworthy happens. In this instance, some unconvincing CGI bats fly past Gavin towards the screen. There's not really much else to say about it. I mean, the bats are okay for 1989. I mean, they make the corridors look a mm. bit more alive and a, a little less samey, which helps. But it would help if the animation wasn't the same or an exact reflection for every single yeah. one of them. That would be my own, my only real complaint. They always follow the exact same pattern when they fly. Well, with another sort of 10 million quid, they probably could have done it. But, yeah, uh, that's what it all comes down yeah, to, really, yeah. is budget, isn't oh, it? Oh, misers. Absolute <laughs> misers, I tell you. It was an expensive programme to make, mm. actually. Mm. Um, I, oh, I know. <laughs> I know. About three quarters as much as a, as a drama. Yeah. So for a children's television show, which is basically what it was, that was a lot of money. Mm. Especially as it's only 25 minutes rather than 45. Ah, at last, the familiar sight. But hurry, team, for the long journey and recent fright have left Gavin seriously short of energy. Yeah. Get the food first, for he needs it. This is the familiar original level one clue room in all its glory. However, on closer inspection, the bricked up doorway that usually resides on the back wall is now absent. It's also been painted blue instead of grey. Perhaps the contractors finally got around to filling in the gaps properly and giving it a, a nice spanking new paint job. Very God does it, isn't it? In the off season. <laughs> it, was not, it, was, it was you, 
did it. All right, okay. You're very dedicated to your work, sir. Well done. <laughs> That's amazing. So on the table, there's an apple, a bone, a bottle marked potion, and a key. The food goes in the knapsack, and Trey Guy gets the team to guide Gavin around to the other side of the table before manifestation takes place. That's right. There's a, there's a face Warning, the team wall. manifestation. This is an unfamiliar guardian, so take special care. Intruder oh, no, alert. Who dares disturb the sleep of Golgara? Answer now, who dares? We get our first ever meeting with Golgarak. Do you notice how light suddenly floods in through the high up window on the left wall mm. um, as, the, as this new war monster appears, which I think is a lovely touch. Um, the source of the light is made deliberately unclear, um, and that really adds an extra layer of creepy <laughs> mystery to the scenes. Galgarak is much bigger than either Olgarth or Granitas. That's because they've removed the um, the bricked up door at the back. It means the whole face can now take up the entirety of the bat wall. So he really looms over the dungeon here more than, than Olgarth or Granitas did. Also, the foam mask with all of its uh, glorious tears and bits of sponge sticking out is now gone as well. And it's replaced by an animated face and Synchrovox mouth, giving the Guardian a bit more of a distinct look as well. The Synchrovox thing, I think it's probably more, most famous for the old Clutch Cargo cartoons. Rory Bremner used to use it quite a bit in the late 90s uh, on some of his sketch shows as well. I, I mean, I have no idea how they did it, but uh, it's interesting to learn at this late stage that that's what they were doing. Golgarak is probably my favourite war monster, I should say, because he's the only one who seems mm. to have some kind of personality his own he's officious and not actually good natured but he doesn't appear to be just angry all the time and he shows signs of a sense of humor um in the mid-season as well david very wasn't it that's right david very later appeared in, in an episode of red dwarf i actually found a flyer from a pantomime you did that was pre-nightmare recently wow the only difference was that they paid me a lot more to play the same part i was playing before uh, in pantomime because they could build me you know whereas before i just went and did it and got peanuts for it <laughs> afterwards i got a bit more money for it which was quite nice i saw you doing i think it was aladdin at the princess hall in order shot have an answer would have been dead dead and never called me brother <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I should mention, um, a couple of months ago, I actually um, found the Doctor Who story uh, from Big Finish that you were playing the con man in, um, uh, I think it was about 2004 that you recorded it or something. Um, yes, I did several of those, and I did um, another one with, what's the double, I can't recall, something or something. Oh, Lord, forget it. I can't. That <laughs> eager plug was just for you, Big Finish Productions. <laughs> Glad we could help. It was great listening to you. I think that was a really good role for you. Sapphire and Steel. Sapphire and Steel, yes. With, with David Warner and Susanna Harker. I work in a care home, and one of our guys is autistic, and his special interest is chuckle vision. Yes. And so we were watching them all on YouTube the other day and you suddenly popped up in one of them. Yes, Count Vlad <laughs> yes. obviously Dracula. The interesting thing about that was the, the little one, little chuckle brother Barry. he was terrified of me. Oh really? Absolutely terrified he wouldn't come near me. Oh wow and The other one uh, didn't mind at all, we got on very well but the little one he didn't like me anywhere near him he used to go and sort of hide <laughs> so it was very funny <laughs> Obviously, you're just that good an actor. I don't know, but it's, it's quite odd, mm. odd, these things that I've done, mm. mostly on television things, mm. it's because it's quite different from what I've done in theatre, which I've played a lot of comedy. And, uh, you know, straight roles, nothing so too horrendous. I mean, pantomime was doing the same sort of thing, I suppose, but um, I don't go into theatres and try to um, go coward in that sort of voice. <laughs> Treyguard informs Gavin he must challenge Golgarak. Gavin does so, and the riddle contest begins. Uh, the War Monster never had to be challenged in the first two seasons. I don't know why it has to here. Well, why not? Well, you're quite right. But neither's going to challenge it. He's stuck there forever. So, it, you know, this, remember, it's all moving true. on. That's true. That's the only way is onward. There is no turning back. So here's the first whittle. Frolic Sorry. and laughter. Fun and flit. What is the name of foolish wit? Did you know this one in advance? No, in didn't know in advance, but I would have known that. Holly. Yeah, it's interesting that one again, because again, you had to give them a clue. I've got to say, I wasn't sure about the clue. A few years ago, I made a meme of the scene where the advisors are thinking to themselves, okay, not folly then. And Alec Westwood saw it on Facebook and told me I was cheeky. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> what you may not have understood, of course, is I have talked back in my ear from the director, uh, which actually was Tim most of the time. I'm not actually the director, but he, he was the one on the other end of this thing. And sometimes you say something really useful to me, like, do something, Hugo. <laughs> 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 well, you, you start doing a tap dance on the spot and then gently wake your way off. Yeah, well, it's camera. just, you know, most of the time you didn't, but sometimes when they really got into a pickle, I would get that and I think, well, what the hell does he want you to do? Because you can't talk back and say, what? You know, it's a box. Right? Mm. But, um, yeah. Yeah, well, they were young and they were they were sort of very shyish, weren't they, that mm. the Scots team? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I never thought they really got into their striders so. and Jerry Paxman is there. But anyway, they got the answer. It was folly. The, the apple, apple of your eye, eye is that, that which you admire. But, but what is the flower of your eye? And the answer is, of course, an iris. They got that pretty quickly. Except they weren't actually connected in any way at all, were they? Uh, apart from the eye bit. If you think about it, the apple of your eye is something you admire. What's the flower of your eye? Well, a girl down the road, actually. I think she's pretty. <laughs> In caverns deep below the ground, stalagmites and tights are found. But which grows up and which grows down? The correct arrangement is mites up, tights down. It's one of those you either know or you don't. You can't work it out. They got that one right as well. So three is the score. Gorgarak tells Gavin to give her something to chew on or her friends may chew on you. He also says that the first step is a tree, but is not the next step. He then tells the team that their quest is for the sword. Draegard reminds them that they have the power to command the war monster in order to gain more information, and they do so. Remember, Gavin, a perfect score means you may command it, and it must answer. See, See I, I command. command you. I command you. I hear you. The doors ahead are not locked by any normal means. Pass on now. For I must return to the sleep of time. So this whole steps thing is new, isn't it? The steps um, in Merlin's yeah. throne room. Oh, um, yeah. I can't quite understand how they would do a mime of a tree. Speaking of steps, there's something I've always wanted to ask. In series two, the level two clue room, they started at the top of a set of steps and had to go down. Did anyone actually ever fall down the stairs? Amazingly not. No one ever fell down the steps. In fact, we didn't have any accidents on set. The only thing I can remember, which I think was one of the few things that were cut, was we had a girls' team who were quite uh, county, you know, quite far back. And uh, the girl under the helmet was a great strider. And they said to her, walk forward. And she covered the whole studio at about five steps and went smack into the back wall. <laughs> she let out an expletive I didn't think she would have heard of, let alone know. <laughs> I think that was one of the few things that was actually cut. <laughs> I wonder why. It, it sounds so harmless. Was she then overly cautious? I, I'm no, it didn't make any difference. That. No difference oh, okay. at all. She's still striding everywhere. Yeah. Now, before we go any further, we have talked in the past about how some of the riddles in the series could be quite ridiculously unfair, while others are incredibly easy. With that in mind, Mr. H here recently put some of the Patreon money to good use to purchase a portable sound recorder. He then took said recorder to digitise a live 2.0 back in September and asked fully grown adult Tom James, who you may remember we had on as a guest back in series one, to answer the questions. So join us now as we play Riddle Me This with Martin Harder. So I'm here with Tom James. Have Hello! Fun, so the idea at the moment is that we're doing a segment called Riddle Me This. Righto. We're looking at some of the riddles that were asked in Nightmare, the riddles that they expected 10 year olds to answer. Yep. And seeing if adults can answer them now. So we've got right, a selection okay. of riddles. I will fail miserably yeah. at this because I'm terrible <laughs> at riddles, but go for it. Well, there's a selection of the easy ones and more difficult ones. Right, so go on then, far away. We'll start off with the apple of your eye is that which you admire, but what is the flower of your eye? A rose, I presume. No, that's not the correct answer. I'm afraid the correct answer is the iris. Oh, for goodness sake, yeah, okay, that makes sense, fine. I was going for apple of the eye, the person you love, okay, no. <laughs> Where falls the blow that harms you not, yet ends the state of common man? Sorry, run that past me again. <laughs> Where falls the blow that harms you not, yet ends the state of common man? Good God, I would never have done well at this show. I've got no <laughs> idea. Go on, fire, go on, fill me in. Well, the answer is on the shoulder. 
It's a reference to the sword dub of Knighthood. Oh, of course. <laughs> but just probably, didn't they get like pre-reading for this at some point, the kids? Or was that another show that they, there was a certain quiz show in the that era that to get the answer they got a load of pre-reading first yeah i don't think so oh in this no case. okay no it's, it's just um, me being a failure i'm just the, trying to get out of it <laughs> but the dungeoneers we've spoken to i don't think they they were but um it might no no uh, that's, that's fine you Go might on, be then. pleased What's... to know you might be pleased to know they didn't get that one right either so great <laughs> Speaking of knights, a knight errant will often follow a maid, but name me the maid who follows knight. Morning maid? I've got no uh, idea. It's, it's a girl's name. Oh, Marion, by any chance? No, no. maid. No. What, what follows knight? Day. Before, think, think of the George no. Romero zombie trilogy. What came after knight? Night of the Living Dead, Night of the Dead. I've got no. I've got to, I'm absolutely appalling at this. Okay, the I'm, answer is dawn. Dawn. Oh, for <laughs> <laughs> no. Here's, um, okay, this one should be quite easy. If <laughs> yeah, my you phone say. Would behave. Uh, what is the bird that is born when it burns? One more time. What was that? What is the bird that is born when it burns? The phoenix. That's right. Finally, one I know. He is the messenger of the gods and the measure of temperature. Name him. Messenger of the gods. Oh, that wasn't Mercury. Oh, no, it was Mercury. Mercury yeah. is the right answer, yes. A prince of Islam in his day held all of Christendom at bay. To Moorish hordes, he was Salah al-Din. But by what name today do we know him? It's not Jesus. No. No, it's... um. Oh. If you don't know your, uh, oh, but you don't know your history, classical Bible, you're not really. gonna, yeah, it's not. I don't think it's biblical. It's not. No, no. you're right. It's not. Go on. What is it? The name, he goes by the name Saladin. Yes. Which is deeper, the ocean or a saucer of water? Which is deeper, an ocean or a saucer of water? It depends on the size of the saucer. Uh, <laughs> which is deeper? What a stupid bloody riddle. <laughs> uh, we'll go with ocean, knowing it's the source of water. It is the ocean, because of course the ocean is deeper than a source of water. <laughs> oh, for God's sake, it's okay. yes, that's so stupid. <laughs> In fairness, again, the dungeon has got that one wrong as well. <laughs> because it's, you think it's two, you're through. Oh, dear. Okay, Lord. so I think you've scored two. You've got the no, I got two, well. yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's Tom with two. <laughs> Jeez. Well, thank you very much. That's thank okay, you, bud. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, well, hopefully get you back on the podcast properly soon. Sounds good to me. Awesome. Back to Gavin and the team now, and they instruct him to take the bone and the potion and guide him out. Punch your right. Walk forward. Where am I? You're in the middle of them. Right in front of you, there's a, a snake's head and its tongue's coming out, forming a bridge right in front of you. And, yeah. and the, the, there's a woman over the other side. She, she's waving you over. Now, right? pay attention, team. Someone, it seems, is inviting you to trust them. It's your decision what to do, but the alternative looks hardly inviting. The tongue keeps However, up. if you don't time Gavin's progress precisely, there's a third choice. And it looks like straight down. This is a bittersweet moment for mm -hmm. me. Me too. The serpent's mouth, Kevin, is of course what we used to call Lilith's domain. And with a few minor adjustments, Lilith um, has seemingly vacated the dungeon. And the serpent now has a tongue that slowly unfurls and then gets drawn back in repeatedly to form a kind of bridge. It's an effective use of the cavern. It's nice to see it in use here, even if it's after Mary Miller's exit from the series. And that, of course, is the bittersweet element for us. It's a very clever use of the serpent's mouth cavern. But the fact that it hasn't got Lilith in it reminds us that Mary Miller, who we are both big fans of, had moved on. I was a particular fan of her performance as Mildred in season two, but she was also very, very good as Lilith. She was a lovely actress. Did you have any um, any kind of friendship with Mary, or, or were you so busy rehearsing you didn't really get much chance to talk to her? Yeah, I didn't get much chance to talk to her, but she was a lovely lady and a bloody good actress. Yeah. I mean, people often say to me, you know, why, why wasn't somebody used more or whatever? But you have to understand it's availability has got a lot to do with it. Now, 
most of these people only had a very small part in each season, so they might be there for a week. Well, are you going to give up a season of touring or a, a West End job to do a week on, on Nightmare? So that's why there was such a big turnover. I mean, we had more than 30 actors and actresses all together during the, the, the whole run. Were you genuinely as scared of her as, as you made Trey God appear when she was playing Lilith? She was quite scary, yeah. <laughs> she is. She's very yeah, scary. She, was. she could be extremely scary. Um, so, so were you genuinely slightly nervous whenever she's screamed, Trey God! <laughs> she's an impressive lady. <laughs> yes. She's a very beautiful lady, too. Lilith and Mildred are two very different characters, but she gets both of them just absolutely spot on. And you genuinely do feel that, um, that uh, she is more an incredibly terrifying person, um, even for a dungeon master who supposedly <laughs> uh, rule that owns the dungeon. And she genuinely scared me as Lilith when I was a kid. And uh, I believe she's left us now anyway, sadly. Rest in peace, Mary. We miss you. Now, a rocky platform has been added at the bottom centre of the screen, replacing the one that used to be on the right corner where the Dungeoneer would arrive from. Gavin is now standing on this new platform. The ledge that Lilith used to sit on has been um, redesigned and lengthened to allow the Dungeoneer to step off of the tongue and exit the chamber that way. And it's on this ledge that we see a maiden appear. She waves to Gavin and then scampers off. Banishes, in fact. Uh, that's probably the first appearance of Melisandre. Zoe, isn't it? Zoe? Zoe Lofton. If she's not actually playing Melisandre there, it's still definitely her. I think they were supposed to meet Melisandre properly in the Vale of Van Buren, but uh, something happened before they got there. <laughs> Spoiler alerts yes. after the event again, everybody. Gavin actually begins to walk forward before he's told to, which looks like it could have been an editing error, actually. Uh, I don't know um, what that was, because I, I noticed that too. Yeah. And... Uh, it actually happens um, at both ends of, of his walk. He, he actually follows the instruction before he's given it. As far as I know, it's got something to do with um, something that actually went wrong in this scene. I'll explain when we get to it. The tongue keeps on going, going in and back, so just listen to the instructions. You're going to walk forward, Gavin, and then you're going to turn to your left and walk forward, OK? So you ready? Walk forward, right, keep going, keep going, faster. Faster. So he makes it onto the tongue, and his team guide him along it far enough to step onto the ledge and exit the cavern. So in 2001, Gavin got in touch with Nightmare.com and told them that originally they'd actually died here. And because the next team hadn't arrived yet, they were allowed to carry on. As far as I can see, um, what's happening here is the first attempt, Gavin fell off the side. I can't remember, I think I, I dimly remember hearing somewhere that he was told to turn left to go onto the ledge and he turned right and stepped, uh, and stepped off the side instead. Um, and so... Uh, they decided to redo it. And what they've done here is they've pasted in footage of both of his attempts at crossing and they haven't quite got the sound clips into the right place. Having said this, it is slowly coming back to me about this. I think it's possibly the only occasion as far as I remember, but I do remember Tim coming down and um, stopping everything here on the floor and I was quite surprised everything had stopped and delivering this sort of lecture, you know. Now, you're really dead, but we're going to let you live a bit longer because we thought you really screwed that up and didn't need to. Now, you've got to know your left and your right and all this went on, <laughs> all because this other team were either stuck in a coach on the whatever it was, the A12. Ah, traffic, <laughs> right. I, I don't know what it was, but it was something like that. And I've only just, you've just reminded me of that. Right. I've totally forgotten it. <laughs> but yes, I remember this and then... Mm. Again, this is, this is priceless history for Nightmare fans. They're all going to love hearing this. When you talk about editing, there wasn't a lot of editing in the way one thinks of editing. I mean, they weren't forever pouring over it and thinking, what can we tighten up here? And screw I mean, what you saw was more or less what happened. But obviously it couldn't be in this particular instance because they're reversing no. a death. No. So... It would be a bit odd seeing the director come down and saying, <laughs> no, 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 stop everything. <laughs> but again, every Nightmare fan would pay lots of money to actually see it. I wonder if the cameras were still rolling and it's in an outtake yeah. somewhere. That would, be, <laughs> that would be fun. It's understandable, the production team, not wanting to waste precious studio time as it does cost money. But at the same time, Gavin get a second chance that a lot of others wouldn't get. It does raise the question of fairness once again. Well, did he really get a second chance, though? Because when he reaches the veil of Bam... Yeah, uh, spoiler, alerts, to... uh, spoiler alerts. Spoiler alerts. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but um, he did get a second chance. He just wasted it. It wasn't him, really, that wasted it. It's, um, it was one of the classic ones, really. I mean, the other famous classic we all know, turn left or well, step left, or side, step, side step, step right, your, step left. Simon, side yeah. step to your left. I mean, it was one of those, really, wasn't it? Um, but also, they hadn't made it very clear to him 
that the the path is the only safe place. No, Not that he could no, see. I know. I noticed that at the time, and thought it wasn't very. Thought that wasn't entirely fair. What, what, you didn't say that there was quicksand there. So how was he supposed to know? I should have said it, but I'm not actually sure that I'd seen that um, scenario before. So that happened quite often, and you think, oh, what's this? I didn't take it in as quicksand. I, I just, I just thought instinctively the thing to do is stick to the path. Otherwise, something horrible is going to happen. Mm -hmm. There you go. Where am I, Gavin? In the big room, um, there's a door um, at the front of the room and a door on the left wall, and there's somebody standing over. El you know, Van Dis! Stand still or perish! Before we get to that, though, we've got the entrance to the Vale of Van Burn. Uh, this isn't a new area, it's rather a repurposed piece of artwork. This used to be Ariadne's lair, but now acts as, as I said, the entryway to the Vale of Van Burn which can be seen beyond the courtyard walls. This is where we get our first introduction to another new character and the first of the elven race in the dungeon, the Lady Velda. She's played very ably by Natasha Pope. Oh, oh yes, Natasha. Martin's quite fond of Natasha. I am, yeah, we, we've been friends on Facebook. I think she overacts a little bit in this scene. Um, I think I think <laughs> she hasn't quite settled into the role of Velda yet. But yeah, she's um, she's once she gets the hang of it and she calms down slightly in later scenes, she does it pretty well. I always thought they didn't give her enough to do really you know she, she was ad-libbing like me gotta remember all these all these people in the dungeon they they didn't have a script as such they just had a sort of a, a an outline of where they're trying to get and they didn't give, give her enough because if the kid doesn't respond that's your biggest problem and if they don't know how to respond so i'm saying you know, gotta be polite it's the existence npc thing we, we, we've got here which is um it's uh, i don't know if you've seen existence it's a, it's a film set in virtual reality and in the virtual reality all the non-player characters when they're waiting for the player to do a particular action before they can move on to the next part of their program until they do that they just keep on recycling the same motion over and over and over yeah, on the spot yeah. and that's a real problem for the uh the, the dungeon characters a nightmare as well they have to wait they have to give the um the dungeoneer a chance to do the right thing um and so they sort of stand there rocking backwards and forwards on their heels looking faintly <laughs> ridiculous what's the waiting well there's nothing where, nowhere for her to go except to keep moving yeah she's basically crouched forward just jabbing forward doing jabbing forward motions with a knife over and over and it's, it does look a little bit ridiculous after a while now be you goblin drone banshee or dwarf you will answer to me or meet your maker well come of what kind are you? Gavin replies that he is human. Velda appears confused and slightly afraid. The dungeon seems to be expanding, encroaching upon the land surrounding the castle. Weird things are happening. Humans aren't supposed to be here. Or is it that here isn't supposed to be here? And to top it off, this giant floating bearded face has just materialised. Hugo, you, you suddenly appear in one corner of the screen here. This was something you were doing a lot in the first two seasons. It stops happening pretty much after this episode, more or less. There's, there's a couple of exceptions. You interact um, with the dungeon characters a lot less after this point. Was that a decision that Tim put to you? or did no, it... no, nobody ever put anything to me. <laughs> one of the things they always were looking out for is to get some comment on the action. Well, you can't really comment on the action on your own, which is why, in fact, the pickle character was introduced. Mm -hmm. It didn't entirely work. We didn't do much commenting on the action, but that was the, the intention. It's quite difficult. If you're going to comment on the action with the advisors there, you have to be careful you're not giving stuff away. You see what I mean? So that's what makes it difficult to actually comment on the action. That was the idea originally. And why I appeared was to make some sort of interaction with the uh, but that had to be pre-recorded, pre obviously. So it was a setup, if you like, which is perhaps sad. It'd be nice to be able to do it. And we did actually once try to ad lib one of these um, uh, in one of the pilots. I think we tried to ad lib the whole thing. But if you're trying to talk into something that's vaguely Middle English. <laughs> it's quite difficult to live. Yes. <laughs> they reduced it basically because they just didn't think it was really working very well then. I don't think it added much to anything except for me to get shouted at by Lilith. Uh, other than that, I, I don't know. So the team consider bribing Velda, but Treyguard puts a stop to such talk. He reminds them again that she is strong on courtesy. So Gavin asks her if he can get past. Could I get past, please? Uh, this seems to placate her. <laughs> Nicely spoken, young human. A fair tongue will get you much that must otherwise be paid for. 
I find this a bit forced and unconvincing. She seems to almost have a total personality transplant as soon as she says please. It seems slightly unconvincing. Perhaps they'd hope they'd come up with something even more so, you know. Yeah. Your ladyship, if you'd be so terribly kind, would you please let us pass or something? Instead of said, can I pass, please? <laughs> Or something. It just says there's something missing, doesn't there? Perhaps had she more experience there. But it was her first go at it, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I think she did. She, she was, did okay for her first mm, time out. I thought she did incredibly well. I very much doubt she'd done that kind of acting before, so... Now listen carefully. I know little of your business, but something of the path ahead and below. This is what I do know. The second step is the thistle but it is not the next step farewell and good luck again how you do a mime of a thistle i can't imagine armed with this advice the team guide gavin onward awkwardly to the vale of van Buren. you seem to be on a path gavin Where am I? you're in a path um just keep going walk forward stop Turn to your right a little bit. Gee, this is almost strange. Left. Wait, these caverns are far larger than any that have existed so far in the dungeon. Best not to linger, for Gavin is in need of food. The Vale of Van Burner is a beautiful place, but very ominous looking. A winding path leads between two cliffs through a menacing looking patch of green. In fact, the whole vale is bathed in an eerie green light, leading to a feeling of foreboding. A figure dressed in white, possibly the same maiden as before, appears to be examining something at the top end of the veil, but she's too far away for us to determine what she's looking at. The team's manoeuvring here is terrible, unclear and indecisive. I have days like that. And leads to Gavin straying from the path. Beware! <laughs> Still, the best thing about a quicksand team is that it's not a slow death. There are noticeable sign of animation improvements between the years here. They're now able to portray much more firmly a Dungeoneer falling. They now have the image of the Dungeoneer descending rather than making the whole image slide off the screen. And they managed to do it in a way that uh, makes it look like someone sinking rather than just plummeting over the edge of a cliff this time. Advisor Brian here makes me laugh because he's smiling away at this and then suddenly realises the camera's on him and suddenly goes to a really <laughs> serious expression. <laughs> it's like a newsreader who's just been reading a fluff piece about a puppy and then has to go on and read a story about a scandal at number 10. It's never safe to stray from the path team. And in this case, you've strayed from the quest. So, what do we make of Team 1 in Season 3 then, chaps? Before we do that, I think Hugo should dismiss Oh, them. yes, that's a good idea. Uh, Spellcasting. D-I-S-M-I-S-S. -S -S. I'm there. <laughs> I'm, I'm 14 years old again. I'm there. I'm there. <laughs> Fantastic. Do you have problems, though? How do you think, how do I spell dismiss? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why they brought in the Unite spell? To make it a, a little bit of a shorter word for yeah, it? There was one, I can't remember what it was, and I suddenly I was halfway through the word, and I thought, am I spelling this wrong? You know, <laughs> actually, I was. But um, it, it was a worry. You, know, you suddenly had to do it. There's that very famous instance with the Shroud spell. Uh, in season two. I was spelling things right. You were sitting there um, in Mogdred's thrall, going, oh, let's up, oh! <laughs> Yes. <laughs> it does have to go down as yeah. one of the funniest scenes in the history of Nightmare. We got a lot of material out of that team, didn't we? <laughs> they are one of my favourite teams, precisely because they weren't very good. What do we make of Team 1 in Season 3, chaps? What do we think of them? I, I thought they were a bit generic, maybe. It's always difficult with a first team of a season because you kind of know from the offset they're not going to win. I think they were perhaps a year too early for them. Um, I think that's yeah. true. I think they were a bit too young and a bit too nervy. And also, they hadn't taken on board enough from if they'd watched the uh, previous seasons about, you know, sidestep rather than mm. turn around. I mean, in the very first ones, I think they were saying things like turn 45 degrees and things like that. Yeah, absolutely absurd. Yeah. <laughs> It took them a while to realise that sidestep and straightforward and whatever were much better than saying try to turn 25 degrees. They're clearly enthusiastic about Nightmare. They're clearly fans of it, um, but they're, they're too camera shy. I don't want to be nasty about them because there's nothing unlikable or, or unpleasant about them. I don't, don't think they were quite ready to play Nightmare. So we can say farewell and good luck to our Scottish challengers. 
for a new challenge is now waiting. Enter Stroja. Trigger's really wasting no time, there is it? They were thrown on quite quickly, weren't they, <laughs> yeah. the second one? <laughs> yeah. Straight on to the next challenger. Yeah. Straight off the bus and onto the dungeon. Welcome. I'm sometimes tempted to say abandon hope, all ye who enter here, but that's hardly likely to encourage a positive attitude. However, what's your name, adventurer? Cliff Denells. All right, Cliff. Well, they say where there's life, there's hope, and you certainly look lively enough at the moment. Cliff Denells. Or well, Cliff Denells, as my wife seems to think it is. Your wife has been listening to Motley way too much. He's joined by advisors James, Richard, and Matthew, and they all hail from Felixstowe. And it's a slightly older and rather sturdier looking team than they usually get. So we've gone from a team that's probably a year too young to a team that's uh, probably ready to join the, a real medieval army. Tim Child always said that he preferred KM contestants to be kids just before the hormones kick in. Traeger hands Cliff the knapsack and reminds him that everything he's about to experience is an illusion. Well, everything except the adventure, of course. That's real enough. You must survive to succeed and succeed to survive. And above all, you must use your brains rather than merely your brawn. Avoid the weapons of your enemies and handle all magic with care. And with that, Traegar places the helmet on Cliff's head and sends him into the dungeon. Where am I? All right, Cliff, you're in a green room which stretches out in the distance. Yeah. Just in front of you, is a small table which resembles a box with the end nearest you missing. Come on, team. He who hesitates is lost, and that's Place. even before the game's begun. Throw the dice! Place Cliff. the table as a dice. Move yeah. forward, Cliff. Okay. Ah, uh, throw the dice. <laughs> what do we do now? Hugo, you actually have to tell them to throw the dice. Um, am I the only one worried for this team already? I think they're a bit blasé. Oh, it's a bit below us. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Go on. I said, nothing was better to do with this. <laughs> sort of feeling. And I thought, <laughs> which is the team again, guide Cliff through the door on the right. Where am I? Are you, you're, on a, uh, you're on a ledge that goes, just goes straight on. Yeah, okay. There's no, there's no danger and no apparent exits. The same ledge crossing from the previous series, although now we appear to be viewing it through a rectangular hole in the rock wall. No edge of ledge jokes here, unfortunately, but we do get introduced to another new character. Oh, blimey, it's Casper the Key only with legs. Out the way! Out the way! Come on, move aside right, for right, a Cliff, you've got some kind of That's a very Jesus. insistent person. Careful now! I didn't mean you to throw yourself off the edge. My conscience couldn't stand it. I'm never going to be a fan of Motley, but I don't hate him nearly as much as I hate Casper. This is one place where Martin and I completely disagree, is that I am a big fan of Motley, mainly for the same reasons that he isn't. Which is what? The terrible jokes. Yeah, I mean, actually, I... Yeah. I, I mean, he's probably the most accomplished of them all, in a way. Hmm. He could deal with any situation, any person. He did add a little lot of stuff as well. And his name, Paul Valentine, is, is a, a, a lovely bloke. Very good in that. Yeah. To be able to do all that stuff, I mean, he could he could rab it for England. He really can. So, um, you know what I mean? Yeah. If he's not getting much out of them, he'll put it there. Yeah. Which well, was, yeah. Uh, I, I thought was a great talent. I, I want to stress, I have no issue with Paul Valentine. I actually, I'm, a, I'm quite a fan of his performances of Sylvester Hands. Um, and even a fidget, believe it or not, I'm, I'm actually something of a fan of his performances as them. It's, it's just the character of Motley. I can't stand listening to his horrible jokes <laughs> and how constantly miserable he gets in season four onwards. Um, I actually I also should say also, in fairness here, I don't mind Motley in season three. In, in this season, he's actually quite a bit chirpier and better natured and a lot less obstreperous. Mm. Um, I think that's the word. So he comes across as less of a nuisance here. He's, he's also less of a nuisance when he shares scenes with another non-player character even if the other non-player character is also annoying he, and he shares a lot of scenes in season three with melisandra so we only get half a dose of each of them so they're, they're less <laughs> they're less aggravating that way um whereas mm -hmm. in season four he only gets a couple of scenes with melly and an awful lot of scenes on his own so there's nothing to tone him down and we're, so we're, we're stuck with the full motley <laughs> So the big question for Hugo is, which do you think is the best jester? Is it Motley or Folly, or are you going to go with the complete wild card of Sylvester? Sylvester the jester from the Geek Week. Mm. I couldn't do this to my colleague. They're so different, so 
you know, what can you say? They're just three different characters. And again, you might say, why did the gesture change? Well, it's again, probably availability. Alec Westwood did a podcast with Paul Flannery a few weeks ago, and he, and he did say that he wasn't going to be available for the third season, so they were going to have to recast. Well, in that case, I'm glad they did it with a new character rather than recasting Folly. I'm not a fan of Folly either, but I, I do prefer him, because at least he can be funny occasionally. But I do think the Folly is really just um, a rehash of Timothy Claypole from rent a ghost I like them all. I'm a terrorist. It is very difficult. For, I mean, I, I used to feel sorry for Tim writing this stuff, because he had to write all these buddies scenarios the very first series i got up scripts like that like old-fashioned telephone directions because that time they thought if they went through the door on the left i'd have one scenario yeah. and if they went through the door on the right there'd be another scenario mm. and that's like an inverted pyramid and it just goes on and on getting bigger and bigger, yeah. and bigger until they realized it didn't matter which door they went through they could still use one scenario <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the kids don't realise that. So it became a lot more linear, shall we say? Yes. Yeah, yeah. But that that um sort of sort of problem of infinite growth. It's, it's it's the old saying about one grain of rice on the first square of a chessboard, two on the second, four on the third. By the time you get to the 64th square, that's more grains of rice that actually exist on the face of the earth. And that's the problem that Tim was making for himself. He, he was creating an infinite scenario. All right, Cliff, my name is Motley, although my mates call me Mott. And as you could see, if only you wasn't wearing that silly act, I am a professional entertainer. Here you have it then, Motley at your service. A quick giggle for a groat and something screamingly funny. If only you'd cross me palm with silver. Motley, we haven't got time for this, you know. Apologies, team. We had enough trouble with folly, but this new jester's turning out to be a complete time waster. This is the only time, as far as I can remember, that Trey Guard interacts directly with Motley. Did Tim discuss that with you and decide to drop it, or it's just, it just something you dropped without telling you again? I don't think he thought it like that. I mean, he just sat down and wrote all this stuff, and uh, I don't think he was actually thinking particularly about how or what or why we would do it. It's, mm. Because remember, he was also making a game show. It's not drama, uh, although it is dramatic, but it's not drama. So I don't think he thought about where it would progress in that sense, me talking to somebody or whatever. I don't think there was any ulterior motives going on, put it that way. Eventually Motley gets to the point and poses Cliff a simple word puzzle. When our esteemed dungeon master, Homage, your worship, goes to sleep, he gets nightmares. Well, what else? Whereas when I goes to sleep, I get sweet dreams. Oh, yeah. However... What does I get when my foot goes to sleep? Cliff gives the answer pins and needles, uh, which is, of course, correct. As a reward, Motley gives Cliff the spell drink, but warns him not to go drinking it all at once. See, that's actually a rare instance of Motley actually saying something slightly amusing there. And then he goes and destroys it just a few seconds later with one of the most insanely awful attempts at being funny in the history of television. And mind you, don't fall off the cliff! Cliff! <laughs> so after Cliff checks that they noted the spell down, he continues along the path and finds himself still on a ledge crossing. It's ledge crossing two. The ledge crossing appears to have grown and is now so long that it covers two actual screens. There are some letters and numbers on the stones, and the team try to decipher what they say, but it's clear not in remotely a bit importance, and after a while, Traeguard gently informs them that they're wasting life force and they should move on. As they begin to walk away, a big knight in heavy armour enters behind them and is apparently intent on doing Cliff some real harm. <laughs> I would like to know what those numerals mean. I'd sometimes wonder if they were put there for a puzzle that wasn't used. Very possibly. That is very possible. Or for something that was about to be used but never got used. There were several of those. Sometimes they got used as credit sequences. Cliff quickly scarpers through the right door again and finds himself on another leg. Albeit, this one is going from bottom of the screen to top of the screen rather than from side to side. This is uh, very obviously the um, scene where the troll and the giant uh, were used and the, and the maggot's pen 
in seasons one and two. It's not actually new this, but we've got a new scene off the cliff. We can actually see outside over a rather huge mountainous landscape. The implication of this is the cliff is on the outer edge of the hill of Nightmare Castle. So it's another outdoors location, again, only briefly. It does almost look like a Bob Ross painting, doesn't it? It does a bit, yes. On the ledge is some food, but the knight is still on Cliff's tail. The team guide Cliff awkwardly to the food. He knapsacks it, and they exit. Did you ever actually see um, anybody face-to-face wearing that armour? Did they tell you what it was like wearing it? I don't know. But I've worn armour like that myself, and it's hell, I can tell you. Does it really pinch? Yeah, well, mostly it's made from fiberglass or something like that. I remember one play I did, Royal Hunt of the Sun, I think it was. And um, I just had to keep cutting bits away, you know, because it was... Uh, it, it was okay when you first put it on. The moment you move, it all moves into a different position and you start chopping your throat off, your arms get... So by the time I finished this play, <laughs> the armour got smaller and smaller and smaller because I kept cutting bits off it. <laughs> so if, if that scene had happened at the end of the season with the, with the Fright Nights, um, it would have been able to fit through the door and carry on chasing the dungeon. <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> yes. <yeah>. So, right. <laughs> it would have been like the Life Force animation in the, uh, the later seasons. Disappearing. Warning team, Cliff must keep moving, but keep your eyes peeled for a possible exit. Dwarf tunnels are also used by goblins. We're about to be introduced by another creature that became a mainstay of Nightmare. We've not met them in the podcast until now, but you'll hear their call every time one of us utters a naughty word. Oh, if we don't remember to substitute the swear words... It gets goblin horned out on the on the uh, the final release of the <laughs> podcast. I'm not sure it was a great idea that they um this gave us a close up view of their face of the goblins because it's not a very convincing mask and it, it's completely lifeless. I actually find that makes them scarier for me. I thought you did, and and you know, you've got to have a close up. Their mums are watching. The goblin horn effect is actually very good in the series itself, as we discussed when uh, watching the Geek Week episode um, a few weeks ago. They uh, had to find another goblin horn sound effect, and I don't think it was all that good. That's a whole different scenario. That. Geek week thing. Yes, it's true. <laughs> it's, it's a very, very different setup. You seem like you weren't altogether happy with how the Geek Week episode turned out. Well, it was very strange because I never knew what it was about. I didn't. I didn't know why it was happening. Anyway, I just got phoned up and said, "Would I do it?" And I mm. said, "Yes." And it was very um, a lot of deja vu about it. And in fact, it was really quite weird. I was in the same dressing room in the same studio, wearing the same costume that I'd worn. 30 years ago. And we had this lovely team of people who are Facebook stars, I'm told. I don't know what, it's not my thing, so I have no idea what that means. But they're obviously very, very popular. And they were lovely people, and they were the worst game players we've ever come (laughs) Absolutely useless. And not only were they useless, they timed their uselessness brilliantly, because they actually blew out when we'd got exactly the right amount of time. Everybody thought we'd fixed it. We hadn't. They just did it as O to the stopwatch. Bang. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we did cover it a couple of weeks ago, and um, we worked out that most of them were around three years old when the series ended. So it was only really the Dungeoneer, Stuart, that actually seemed to have any interest in Nightmare. Yes, I don't think the others had at all. And there was, uh, outside the studio, there was this whole bunch of lovely girls waiting and for a moment, I thought, ah. <laughs> then I thought, don't be silly. And I walked out through them, and they didn't, didn't take the slightest notice of me. Was no. <laughs> they, were all they were looking for ashens. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, probably. vanity, vanity. Yeah. <laughs> probably all the Dan stands, I guess. Of which our very own Amy is one. Amy's appeared on uh, one of these as a guest uh, back at Christmas, and uh, she's a bit of a fan of his, yeah. Harry Cliff, I have detected footsteps behind you, and they appear to be gaining. Approaching Cliff from behind the two goblins, the hurry up mechanic, a choice for the show from here on, and a fan favourite. Dressed in a brown cloth and carrying a dagger and an axe, respectively. These two present a menacing threat. The use of masks over makeup, for me, only goes to make them seem creepier and more effective. What's not affected, though, is the technique of speeding up the film to make it look like Cliff is walking faster. There's an exit straight ahead of you. Keep walking. Where am I? Cliff, you're in a room to your right. There's an area of water. Yeah. On your... Over the far side, I'm over the water, there's... 
What's that on there? It's a face. Um, this piece. There's yeah. a face or something. No, I think, team, it's a okay. thirst for knowledge that you have, but it's water that bars your way. Did the water convince you straight away? Funnily, funnily enough, when I was a kid, yes. It did me at the time, but when I've looked at it since, I thought, well, would I have known that was water? Today, um, we're comparing it after we've had um, years of uh, Star Wars prequels and, uh, and and what have you. So we're comparing it with what would be done today. Back in 1989, I could suspend my disbelief quite easily. It convinced me until it started draining. Well, I quite like the draining because that's, that's uh, I, I mean... Yeah. It, it's more like mercury than water, isn't it, the way it drains? Yeah. In computers, when water starts looking like mercury, that's the point when it tells you it's CGI, yeah. I think. It's, uh... Traditionally, it's one of the most difficult things to animate in CGI. What we got is um, inspired by Roman barbs, rather elegant-looking columns on the wall surrounding the ledge. Mm. I, I find it looks really striking. I think it's a clever basic idea with bags of potential. Mm. And they do genuinely think up some wonderful varied ways of making use of the water um, throughout the season. And this is one of them. I think it's really quite clever. Tim Child or David Rowe, whichever one thought of that, was really, really had a real moment of inspiration with this one. It's it's one of my favourite um, chambers. It is a ledge framing a large pool of water. There's no visible exit at the moment. Yeah, well, that was quite clever, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. Tim quickly realised that what they have to do... Um, is cast the spell. Give them credit here. So you know, I was, I was saying earlier that they needed explaining the dice to them, but so give them credit. They've um, now they've got up and running. Mm. They're being quite assertive and moving pretty quickly. Their manoeuvring has improved very quickly as well. They're already moving quite smoothly, and they don't need too much prompting um, to think of using the spell. Spell casting. Drink. D R I N K. With a gurgle, the water disperses through a drain, a drain just big enough for a dungeoneer to crawl through. Cliff sits on the edge of the pool and lowers himself into it. As he approaches the exit... Warning team, the tide may have run out, but time still waits for no man. Now it's your enemy. Alas, time has flown, and until the next phase, all adventuring must now cease. Join us again soon for Nightmare. It's the stuff that dreams are made of. I don't know why, but I always love it when a Dungeoneer yeah. is forced to crawl under something. I can't remember. I assume there was a rostrum down the side, mm. which acted as the ledge. Well, it's yes. inside. Like, um, they must have worked out what height to build it, because it could be too big for some teams, couldn't it? And too small for others. Yeah. So yeah. Getting it just right was uh, quite clever, I think. I have to admit, it's one of those scenes where I wonder, would they be allowed to do it today for health and safety reasons? Because uh, you have got somebody in a blindfold really fairly high up off the floor. Accidents could have happened. Overall, yes, jury is, is definitely out on the effect used to drain the water mm. away. Um, but overall, I think it's a very neat spell puzzle. Um, and it's a very neat room and a very welcome addition to the architecture. If I'm the chairman or whatever it is of a jury, then I say it's all right. I like the way the yeah. water goes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. I'll, absolutely, boss. And I, uh, I never, I never, I wouldn't dream of contradicting <laughs> you, boss. Curiously, um, this team are already about seven minutes into their quest, and they still haven't found a clue room, which is pretty unusual. Yeah. They got their brains in gear rather nicely, mm. and they're starting to make smooth progress. Uh, they're comfortably better than Team One, who were uh, much of a muchness. Uh, this, this lot are pretty good. Yeah. So, and they're yeah. all articulate. Yes, they are. It's always a bonus. Right, so that's the end of Series 3, Episode 1. You can follow us at Twitter. We're at NightmarePod. If you want to support the podcast, we're NightmarePod on Patreon and Ko-fi. Speaking of Patreon, here's a shout-out to Keeper of the Book of Quests, David N. Rabbit. Advisors Benjamin Bloom, Peter Polsford, Peter Sidon, and Stuart Leveland. And Dungeoneers Peter Corridge and David Thompson. Support us on Patreon at Dungeoneer Level or above to get your name mentioned on the podcast. Our website is nightmarepod.co.uk. If you're looking for Temple Discussion merchandise, including t-shirts like this spectacular one that I'm wearing, and which we not can't show you because it's only a podcast, uh, or stickers and other products, it's at nightmarepod.redbubble.com. You can email us at podcast at nightmarepod.co.uk. And 
Hugo, we have this sign-off, which we usually share between us, but it would be an absolute honour if you could do it for us. Just keep telling yourself, it's only a podcast. Isn't it? Standing ovation! <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm a, I feel like a 14 year old child again, that's it. Lucky you, I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs>